Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, my name is Mike LaRook. Uh, work with a company called uh, Unforgettable Coatings. Uh, we are a painting and coatings manufacturer. Um, my background comes from uh, pretty pretty traditional. I'm from Ohio. Um, went to Kent State uh, University um, and actually went into uh, hospitality after college was uh, everything from a bartender to a manager uh, in the food and beverage industry. Uh, I did that for <clears throat> many years. I moved out to Las Vegas and did that uh, from the age of 22 to 35. And uh, I was actually recruited from a, a bar restaurant I was managing to get into the sales side of things. And um, uh, basically been doing this for about, uh, you know, almost almost 10 years now. What was it like getting used to? It's different than bartending and serving and managing. Oh, yes. Um, I never wanted to. It's interesting. I always said I did not want to be in a sales position. So I, I always, always wanted to make sure that I um, was in a position that, you know, you have a captive audience when you're when you're in a restaurant. So uh, and, and so what I, I looked into when this the industry that we are in uh, is basically the HOA painting service or multifamily as an apartment or commercial repainting side of things. And um, the way I thought about it to justify the switch over was uh, I, I was like, this is not a sales job. They, they are going to need paint and we're going to supply that service. That, that's how I justified to, to make the switch. Uh, fun, quick little stories. I was, I was, uh, had actually decided to not make the switch. And then my dad and I had a a long conversation and he said are you familiar with the term nesting and i said i mean i think i know what it means and he explained he's like we're very comfortable in a position where you're at and he said does this job possibly make you uncomfortable and i said yes and he said what's the worst that could happen i said it could not work out and i would come back to restaurants and uh he said okay you know he goes make a decision tomorrow and then i did make it tomorrow and i actually did make the make the switch well that's it because hospitality can pay really well the challenge is it doesn't have a long tail yes yes it's also <laughs> it's also hard for life and yes. and uh and and you know it's fantastic in your early 20s right, right. like you're social uh, yes you know and, and working at night is not a horrible thing but when you start to get into the family side of things you work nights weekends and holidays yeah. Um, and, and when you're on the management side of things, uh, you are the one, if somebody doesn't show up, you know, you're the one that goes in and out here in Las Vegas, you know, we have a lot of graveyard bars, um, and there's nothing worse than sitting at home at, at midnight and the swing shift bartender calls you and says the graveyard bartender didn't show up, you know, so you go in. Yep. You're the safety net. You are the safety net. Yep. Right. And then. And that, when you turn 50, that's not what you want to be doing. Oh man, it's, it's rough, you know, and you can see it. Like if you're looking at somebody who's 50 years old in the food and beverage industry, they have a tendency to look 60. Like it, it adds 10 years. It wears on you standing yep. up all the time, stress. Oh man. <laughs> I, I remember once I was between jobs and, and it took about, I remember it took a month in Vegas. Things were, things were not clicking along and I took a month to get, get a uh, job and I was doing some, some side stuff in between, but from that month um, when I went back to work and had to be on my feet for, for the whole shift, you know, 10, 11 hours, I was, my back was, and I was, I was 27 years old at the time and it, it, it killed me like my back and my feet. And, and just one month you lose that ability to stand. And, and you, we know like it is in, in, in a sales position when I go do a trade show for four oh. hours and I stand there for four or five hours, I'm like, Oh man, this is crazy. And I used to do that 10, 11 hours every day. Yeah. And you know, trade shows even worse because you, you don't get much walking. It's yep. purely straight one, one spot. Yes. Yes. And so when you got into sales, I take it, did you have much inbound or was they hired you to go get new business? Right. So, um, my, uh, I, and just so you know, it's interesting. The company I started with, uh, just like my dad and I talked about did not work out. I worked for there for like eight months and I was given a very small, uh, book that I, uh, had to kind of gain some traction with. And, I was only given about eight months to to do that, and and it's a the company I worked for was very, let's say, 
kind of like, uh, if I would say CRM based, they're very metric based. Um, and some of these, uh, like in, in my business, there it's a long time from the point of uh, RFP uh, to to actually uh, close of the deal. It, it, it can be, I've had as long as four years, you know, but yeah. it, it can be as short as a month sometimes, but generally speaking, it's six months to a year on, on the, on the larger projects. So that eight month time frame was, was just not enough to really gain some traction. And, you know, I've been on the board of a homeowner association. Yep. It's a nightmare. So yeah, uh, Brian, that's actually funny. I'm on, uh, I was going to talk about that too. I'm actually on a board as well, uh, just uh, of my homeowner association, just partly so I can fully understand how we think. So you you understand exactly what, what I do. You open the bids and you look at what, what we do. Oh, well, you, you get, and everyone has different values, different point in their life, how long they plan on owning it yep. and what their particular you know, viewpoint of the property is. Yep. And yes. it's just frustrating. Some people are like, well, look, I put my money in. I want my value out. Yes. Yes. Others like look at it, a bank account. Like they're going to pass it along into the next generation or something. Well, yeah. And, and I think that's the important part is, and there's a fiduciary responsibility that you're carrying as a homeowners association board. Right. And, and basically some carry that with, with high levels of prestige and, and others are a little more loose with that. Right. And, um, and that's, and that's actually something I teach to our crew is understanding the sociology and psychology of the board member. You know, why does somebody want to be a board member? And, and it really does fall into probably about 10 different uh, categories. But um, and, and we actually break that down. So we kind of understand you have to understand you might have the president, but that's not the alpha of the board either. Right. Yeah. And that's it, because most no one, none of them are getting paid to do it. It's yep. all. Oh, it, it, yeah. Voluntary. So so what you know, what was your this is actually I do this often. What was your reason for joining the board? It was a, a lot of. What I, what I saw up is it was like a year and a half, two years. Uh, it was basically one neighbor uh, said, well, why don't you get on the board? And my particular part of the property had something that needed attention that didn't affect anybody else as much as it did me. Yep. And it did affect the public uh, grounds as well. But, you know, I was really, me and a couple of neighbors were the only ones that saw it. And it was a very expensive fix. Yep. And if I didn't get on the board, it, it never would have happened. Yeah. So you did it for the, the overall greater good. And, yeah. And then, and, of course, you get the alpha where, you know, the people who don't work, who yep. make it nosy neighbors, who don't want to spend any money on anything. hundred <laughs> percent, you know, and, it, and I find it's very interesting if you uh, look, if I meet a, a male board member, that is retired, the first thing they always tell me is they tell me what they used to do. It, okay. it, it, they will say it within the first one minute of conversation. And and I find that very intriguing because uh, mo most are there and, and a lot were important high level positions. And so this, this triggers some of that self-worth. Uh, I think as men, we have, uh, we identify with, with work very, very highly, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and if I, you meet a female board member, they will talk, uh, more about the project much quicker and they do not tell me what they did prior often. So I, I feel your pain. <laughs> so, and how do you sell to that? Have you found a particular process that's because you must prioritize these projects because yeah. from the time you get the bid, like you said, to the yeah. time they award it and you get started. So in, in that, uh, I'd like to back up a little bit, just kind of break things down. When, it, when I came in to the position, uh, I was I was nervous about selling. Um, and in the prior company, uh, worked on a lot of sales tactics. They, they they we had a I remember we had a training that said how to get a signature in a board meeting. We even did role played this. Um, and I remember thinking I, that that did not hit me as things I liked. You know. Um, Fast forward, uh, you know, good thing it didn't work out. Maybe because because I'm different. Uh, number one, I, I never think that way. You know, the the project will happen, um, and the length of time is not up to you to determine. 
you know, if there's more time allowed, that gives you more of an opportunity to uh, ba basically, you know, add other pieces to it. Um, and, and I'll give you some more of the breakdown, but I do think about it like uh, counting cards in blackjack. Yep. Are you familiar with yep. that? You know, like the, the plus ones. Uh, and the more plus ones you get, that the means the more face cards that are out there, which can increase your tendency. But that's that's basically what I think of is as we're getting closer and closer to the decision, can we add more plus ones? And and the important way to think about that is is Brian, since you understand it, when you get to that high number, and they are going to deal out the hands, does that guarantee you're going to win the next hand? No. It just has increased your your, your odds, odds, right? Like right. you've increased right. your probability. So <laughs> do not change the timeline. Just try to get as many plus ones as you do. And even when we come up to that decision point, when I'm laying in bed that night, um, the only way I'm okay with a win or a lose, a loss, is when I think this is I have done as much as I can that I can think of at this time. Uh, and I always say at this time because maybe in the next uh, proposal I'll be able to think of something else creative or interesting. Well, I got to believe that you run into lowest bidder. Yes. As, because, and the, the people on the board, there are the people that d assume everything is equal except for the price. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's great. Great question. Um, and go, well, go ahead with the. Well, I, I ran into that where yeah. we, you know, they, they, they changed landscapers every year. Yeah. And we got a great landscaper. They were 10% more expensive, but they were great. Yeah. yeah. And of course, when I left the board the next year, it was a bunch of college kids. Yes. Yeah. So it was 10% um, 10, 10 cheaper, but they were yeah. terrible. Yes. You know, and, and we see that. And, and I, and I, the way I, I approach that is again, being on a board, I fully understand the fiduciary responsibility, right? So you come in high, 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 that's, that's rough. That's going to be very hard for a board to choose you, right? Um, if you come in mid, you're in a pretty good spot. If you're mid to low and you're just, just in that, if you're getting some time and by law in Nevada, where we're at, you have to get three, they have to solicit three bids, yeah. but if they get four, so the way I approach that is sometimes I will give options. Um, I will go. show here's, yeah. here's a, here's a value based in the paint world, uh, in the coatings world, we have the good, better, best, right? So I, I, I break down different options so they can look at that. And, uh, I explain those options, uh, and then allow them to choose, uh, where, where it's going to be the good, better, best. And, and also in those positions, I show, you know, our good price might be slightly higher than, or way higher than some very small, uh, not, you know, some, some guy who doesn't even have a full contractor's license. Right. Like, so, so you, you have to compete in, in, in properly and, and also follow through with what you do. So I, when I bid, build a bid, I build it with packing in as much value into the price that I've given, yeah. uh, you know, cause you ever hear that term, like elite salesmen sell elite products. Uh, yeah. it, it's, I, I think, I think that's a good, term the best the best people uh work for the best companies um and, and they have a tendency to gravitate to that but i also think we underestimate how important it is the salesperson in the actual product or process itself right because you know the fiduciary responsibility isn't just to price it's to maintain the community at the standards that has been set. Yep. And, yep. you know, because we had one particular board member just didn't want to spend money on anything. And I tried to explain, we're not here to save money. We all can save our own money. Yep. <laughs> we're yes. here to judiciously maintain the community within our budget. To make money when you sell your property, right? Like, so the idea of an HOA only is to keep the property value up w without that piece an yes. HOA board would not exist. Um, they, they, if you look at all the laws that they write and everything, they claim it all this, but it's flat down to one thing. It is maintain property value period. Yes. And, and that is like, if your neighbor has a car on Jack stands that hurts your property value as yeah. well as theirs. And, and that, so those are the regulations that come out of that, but it still comes from property value. And it, because if I was selling to this, my board, I would have yeah. ran because I know that they're going to go with the lowest bidder, no yeah. matter what, or 
they would delay everything. It was like yep. a stairway was broken, took yep. five years before they fixed it. So, and that, and that's a good thing about our industry is we can, w once you understand that, and, and this is, I don't qualify, I don't use that term, that regular term of qualifying too much, you know, like, uh, well, but it's I, counting cards. It's evaluating your hand. Exactly. So, and, and you, you, the RFP comes out, I try to set up a meeting with the board, uh, which I consider a plus one, right? If you can get in front of the board or, uh, the owners, if we're in, in multifamily or commercial side of things, the, um, then you're, you're stepping forward each and every step, including, including the managers that manage these properties. Um, so those are all I consider the plus ones, but you might learn something and you recognize like, I'm going to have to build a value based proposal here. Um, you know, you could choose not to, not to bid it. Uh, but, but you can usually build a proposal around. It's very like progressive. There are significant, we say good, better, best, but there are multiple companies, uh, multiple approaches, uh, and, and exactly what they want. Uh, and, and like, you can talk them down to a two color scheme versus a four color scheme, and that's going to save them money. And then you explain that yeah. and, and you say, if you want to do a two, a four color scheme, that that's, that's harder and it takes more time. Well, I, I like a couple of things about that. I like the giving the good, better, best. That way, if they, they focus on price, they know what they're giving up. Yeah. They oftentimes won't choose the good uh, or the lower one when you do give a couple options. Um, I used to do good, better, best uh, because I, I was follow that. And then um, I, I'm a big fan of TED Talks. And uh, there was one. Uh, by Barry Schwartz was was the paradox of choice. Have you ever seen that one? Yeah, yeah. Don't uh, give too many choices. <laughs> uh, and and it's amazing how I mean three he identifies as okay, right? You will have confidence in your choice, but with two you have the highest level of confidence in your choice. So I, I have over the years backed down to a a two choice two levels uh, when I create those proposals. Yeah. more often than the three, just based on Barry. And, and he's actually right. We deal with a lot of colors and I present colors to a board. When I first got in the industry, I would, I'd get a bunch of renderings and I'd say, here you go. And I'd give them like 15 renderings in this board. I mean, they were, they were lost, you know, that, and then over, the problem. Yeah. over time, I've been able to uh, whittle that down and I give them two choices out of the gate, sometimes three, and then have them try to narrow me down from there. And then I, I'm presenting more choices as we move forward, but they're only coming in these stacks. So they're not coming all together, which is overwhelming for them. And it also, as Barry says, it creates the least amount of satisfaction when you do make a choice. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like it because like a lot of auto dealers, they give you the cash, lease, um, loan options. Mm -hmm. and it, that really starts to get you confused. Yes, exactly. Too many, it's, and then you walk away, like, did I make the right choice? Because if you, everything's on a spectrum, right? And piece by piece by piece is not as far from the other piece. So meaning that you chose something and you should have more confidence because you had so many options, but you feel less because it's a small percentage. You chose one out of 10 options. You feel that you had a 10% chance to get it right. Yeah. And, and I think early in the process, more choices are okay because it spurs conversation. Yeah. It, but, it's, it, yeah, it can be, you know, like I said, uh, but and, and if tough. it pulls out value of yes. what they care about. Yeah. Because if you get a board member who really cares about paint, maybe they were a painter, maybe they were a contractor, maybe they, they have, a certain history with it yeah or it personally affects their piece of the property yeah exactly exactly and and they might have uh, a lot of them do come from the my favorite ones are the ones that come from the contracting background um in this this i'll give this little little background here a step back is when i did come over from food and beverage uh i had i'd gone to college for hospitality I had been in the in college. I worked for at the time it was BW threes, a very small uh, bar and restaurant at the time, and I was I worked in the ninth uh, location ever in Kent State, uh, and now it's obviously Buffalo Wild Wings, which is a monster, um, and uh, even opened the first one in Las Vegas. But uh, my point being is, when I came over to paint, I was like, wow, I, I did not know anything you know i knew as much as anybody who had went and bought some paint uh, once in a while 
at, at Home Depot. So I did not even understand the good, better, best. I did not understand what it is. Um, I'm a bit of a science nerd. So the first thing I did is I just went overboard and, and I dove in and I studied everything I could and learned everything I could and asked as many questions as I could about paint. Um, and, and over the years have become a, a bit of a technical expert when it comes to that. And that has served me a couple ways. I initially thought it would serve me just because it helps build trust when you're talking to somebody and they have some questions. But over the years, I've recognized that there's a secondary piece that when you know about what you sell or do, you have a higher tendency to be whom you are to the person. And, and meaning like you, Mike, uh, Mike, as in the third person, me, I can be more of me, you know, when I know that I don't have to fear them asking a question about what we're supposed to do on this type of stucco. Yeah. We don't necessarily have to talk about this type of stucco, but if they do, then I am prepared. Therefore, I'm not thinking about it. Therefore, I'm actually being more of me. Now, on the outbound side, you don't really approach the boards directly. Do you go th you go through the, the management companies? Correct. Yeah. So we we basically market our services to the management companies, um, and and so they we have kind of a, a two levels of clients, right? So we have the the management companies and the managers we work with. So those are clients, uh, but even in just by term because they don't sign the checks, but they're super important, obviously, and yes. we've established relationships with them. Um, and, and that's, and then they are the ones that send out the RFP. Uh, and, and sometimes you bought you, we go to trade shows that where some board members are invited and we, we have direct contact. So, but it, it goes through managers more often. Yeah. And what do they care about? They just care about friction frictionless companies. Yes. No, <laughs> no. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple, right? Yeah. Like who can do the best job, um, who can let them receive the least amount of calls from the board. Right. And who can, uh, I think it's important too, is, is fix, fix problems, right? Like how, how fast can you fix, uh, uh, problems, you know, the see it, own it, solve it, do it, uh, approach. Um, you know, you get a phone call and there's a problem, you go correct it nice. uh, and it's off the manager's back. You know, we also try to circumvent that and, and uh, you know, we post a lot of notices that have our number on it. So they call us directly for a lot of things. So when we do a project with them, the managers hopefully getting less calls because we're A, circumventing it and B, correcting that as fast as possible. And yeah. this, is, this is a piece of advice I'd give. Um, in my position, those those calls are going to come to me, and you cannot hand it off. Um, if you hand it off, it will or will not get done, um, and and that's that's not it's just not designed in that system. So you you a lot of times you can uh, I try to correct it if I can. You know we're a very forward thinking uh, company to the point that we have a, a credit card. We all have a credit card with a monster limit that we have no. No, we don't have to have any approvals. We can just go do something. Um, if I want to, if somebody is, if we broke a, a screen, uh, you know, I can just go pay for one to, to go fix it. I can go buy a gift card uh, immediately. I can pay for a car to get washed without even a question. I don't have to call and get verification. Um, that changes the overall feeling of how you operate on, on the flip side. Because if there's a problem, can I solve it? I will solve it. It's over. Yeah. That, that's it and and it becomes uh like it becomes frictionless and and i'll share a quick story um i i compare it to this so imagine going into meeting with a board and there was a full repaint that they're deciding on okay and at this full repaint um the board says hey we have a broken window on the front of our clubhouse would you throw that in would you repair that and this is prior to the choice. The answer is yes, right? <laughs> like, yes. And here's and I, and I always find this interesting. So same scenario, but flip it a few months. The full repaint is is over, okay? And now four months have passed since that repaint is over. A lot of these are condo communities. A homeowner comes home, and they see a a window is broken in their spare bedroom that they don't go into often, which could have happened. It was, it was summertime when it was painted, cold, uh, pressure washing, right? What is, what is the answer there, right? Now, the, 
a lot of people start to say it's been four months. We, we how do we know? You know, it's and, not and, about fault. Yes, it's not about fault. It's about <laughs> perception, and just fix it. This was a full repaint, and yes, the money has been paid. Well, which in theory should be even more idealistic. You, the first one, you haven't paid it, gotten any money. The second one you have. And now we, we, so in that situation, I just say, yes. Yeah. Sometimes boards are like, we don't think it's you. And I was like, that's fine. We'll take care of it. That's understood. It. Yeah. Uh, we're we're not know. detectives. We're fix it guys. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like what is your, what is your problem? Okay. I'll fix it. Uh, right. Know? Because having been on the board, it, it was the management company that would come to us with vendors. Yep, right. exactly. And th th their, their income is fixed, whether they yes. do a great job or they do nothing. Correct. So Correct. anything that you get them to do something, that means you're a hassle. And Wanna, yep. we, we had a major project done here this summer, and we were told to call the management company if there was any issues. And of course, the contractor came and parked in front of my house, blocked yeah. me in. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to call the management. No, I'm going to go out there and yell at them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Get your car out of here. Yes. Yes. Just <laughs> that's funny. Did they respond quickly? Well, they moved the car and the next morning it was back there Sick. again. <laughs> <laughs> that's rough. That's rough. And, but that's, that's the things that a bad contractor pays no attention to because they're like, we're going to be here. We're never going to get called again, but you're in front of a board member's house. Well, I think I think that falls into line where you see production on one side and sales on the other. Yes. And we, even as a company at times, um, I myself, uh, I, I, I kind of like getting paint on my hands. You know, um, I, I came from food and beverage, which is so heavy production, right? Like as a manager, I was a cook in college before I became a bartender and in in a kitchen is only is just a factory, but it's more complex <clears throat> in a factory because it's dealing with perishables on the front end. So you have days, or if it's frozen, you have weeks and, and months before this perishes, which is different than if we were working in a tire factory, we would be able to have something raw materials that could last for years. And then you flip it once it's produced, once we make that tire, it's got five minutes to get and it's even less than five minutes, right? Like it's if it's less. sitting in a window five minutes. So, I mean, they have to be eating it within two minutes from the point of production at five minutes is where uh, you're, you're now in trouble, right? And you might have to remake that tire as in the food. Um, so when I, when I came over to this, being involved with the production side of things, it was, it, it lined up very similar to um, anything in, uh, you know, uh, Sorry, the light turned off here. Um, yeah, the uh, it lined up with anything that was like uh, a banquet order, BEO, banquet event order, is identical to what we do when we start a project. You have, you have all the front end details, what the actual project's going to be, or the items of food, and then I, I uh, was able to match that up, and it was very, it was it was native to me. Um, so I get very involved with that production. Then we have that separation, though, at times where if you hand it off over to production, they don't have the full understanding. They never met with the board, right? They don't understand the promises that were made and they can't carry that with. So, so being involved in the production side has so many pieces. Number one, it follows through with what you said when I, you're at that board meeting. Number two, it helps you understand the product for future sales. And number three, it's just an overall confidence uh, of, of what you do, which comes through in every single day. I was told a story. It was actually, I was told this story this morning. Uh, there was a cake manufacturer that came out with a really good product years ago that you only needed to add water to bake a cake. And it was highly unsuccessful because people would do it and they did not have the pride when they brought it to somebody's house and said, I baked this cake. So they took out some of the pieces that they were able to dehydrate and put in there and it was milk and an egg. So you now add milk and egg to the mixture and people, it became highly successful just from adding those ingredients. And the same thing with sales versus production. Be involved. It doesn't have to be hugely involved. You don't have to be spraying paint on a wall. But you have to, uh, if you're there, if you have to pick up items at the at the paint store or run to Home Depot, these things are monster value adds, which show through later. <clears throat> Excellent. Hey, I really appreciate your time today, Michael. Where can people go to connect and follow you? 
Uh, yeah, I guess I'm Michael LaRook on, on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's it. But I, I'm not too, too big on the social media. So no, uh, but yeah. <laughs> well, we'll find you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate you, you know, and, uh, and, and it was good time, uh, and appreciate the interview.